Hey guys, welcome back to Daniel's Tech World on uh, YouTube. And for this video, I want to demonstrate my current Ubuntu desktop backup approach. Now, for people not involved in the world of, uh, you know, haven't thought twice, this video is really intended for anyone using Ubuntu Linux who wants to take, um, I'm just demonstrating my current backup approach. Now, I'm gonna go through the various tools, I'm gonna, th I'm gonna go through the rationales, I'm gonna try to do so relatively quickly because this is not the most engrossing subject, I'll be the first to agree with that. Although actually, the more you learn about backups, the more interesting things that there are to learn about them. This documentation is on GitHub, my username is Daniel Rosal JLM. Um, I always think I might change that, so just type Daniel Rosal get up. There's only, I think, two uh, of us in the world, and I think the other person uh, is not involved in technology in any way. So uh, my GitHub uh, account, if you look up the master backup strategy repository that I currently have pinned to my homepage, which has been forked once, which is, uh, which is a, a nice milestone uh, for myself, uh, this is it. So basically, I've documented this in a markdown file also in the repo, I have a couple of scripts that I use in my own backup uh, operations, uh, you know, taking local files. You can see uh, what I'm doing here, uh, just giving myself, uh, I have a B2 bucket, uh, my Linux backups, and I'm just kind of just the auto key config, the open box config, LibreOffice, stuff that I don't want to have encased within a whole system backup that I might want to look at. That's the rationale there. And uh, I have my these little graphics here, the PDF, if anyone wants it, of V1.3. I called it V1.2 initially, then I did some updates while I was making this infographic, hence it's now V1.3. Um, basically what this is, is it's currently what I use for backups. Now this master backup strategy, I called it master because I described both my local backup approach and my cloud backup approach. So I want to back up really as many uh, different um, things as possible. I want to get everything on my desktop. I want to get everything in the cloud. I want to get everything, I call this minor cloud backups. It's my own terminology. I've never heard anyone else describe major and minor clouds. But I'm talking by major cloud stuff like Google Drive, Dropbox, P Cloud, and SaaS slash minor cloud is stuff like Reddit, Quora, Twitter. Now, I'm really, really vigilant about cloud backups, and I want to make sure everything, including Reddit and Quora, at least, I mean, ideally to do this every three months. This, unfortunately, um, there's a cool there's a cool tool called Skivia, which is just about the closest I've, uh, I've come to seeing what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for really is something that, you know, would take Reddit and Quora are not here because it's it's manually. You need to literally write into their team and say, can you please give me my data export? And that's only uh, available uh, as a result, actually, of, I believe, uh, GDPR, which gives grants data subjects um, the right to have a copy of their own data. They didn't have it before then. I think it's fair to say that was the result. A lot of people have started offering it now that never did that before. Uh, this is a nice tool, Skivia. You can see you've got stuff like Sugar, Zoho, Dynamics, your major CRMs here. And uh, they just give you a bunch of connectors basically, right? So um, you can see backups of major use case, solutions, uh, data, let's go for data, replication. Uh, this schematic explains it quite nicely. So you have all your various things here in the cloud, <clears throat> your Salesforce, your HubSpot. Um, and then it's just this connector basically. Um, uh, and then just mirroring that to wherever you want it to be mirrored, uh, such as a data warehouse, for example. This is really a mature enterprise product intended for big scale. Something a bit more user friendly would be Mult Cloud, uh, which uh, again, their library is not brilliant. It kind of has stuff like Evernote and then doesn't have other stuff. It's inconsistent, but I use it because stuff I use uh, happens to be covered, uh, although I couldn't get B2 to work, uh, unfortunately. So that's what I do in the cloud. I, as I say, you can use more cloud and you can use this nice tool called Flexify and that really moves stuff at lightning speed uh, across the wire, direct cloud to cloud. Um, another approach which I will just show quickly is using spinning up your own EC2 instance on AWS and uh, P Cloud 2 B2 backup. I think I should find my own stuff because here we go. Not many people are probably using both P Cloud and B2 and are looking for a way to back them up. So that was a previous video I did. 
and uh, that's basically is firing up EC2, installing our clone, that's a CLI that is for cloud to cloud backups, um, based on our sync, I believe, and then uh, on the EC2 instance, uh, actually directly running that backup. Uh, and then obviously the rationale there would be using the using the uh, upload speed that the, that is available directly on the cloud as opposed to your own internet connection. Um, so this is my cloud approach and the overall strategy I have here in my graphic from my article on, uh, I believe it was, linuxhint.com. Uh, my overall goal here is to be compliant with 321. So I'm going to explain what 321 approach to backups is. Now, if you do not trust me on this, um, a lot of really good stuff has been written about 321. Carbonite, for example, have this re resource. So let me read and I'll show you my my uh, my my own thing. So this is why I call 321 a misnomer because uh, you can see here that includes the original copy and at least two backups. Um, so this on my schematic here, I let's say let's for the sake of argument say that we're using an SSD as our primary uh, as our primary Ubuntu desktop that we're trying to protect. Um, it could be an HDD, a hard drive, or it could be an NWME. But in any event, uh, we need to to get to the first number three. We need to create two backups. So it's actually original source plus two backups, as Carbonite made clear, not three backup copies. Um, the next thing in the 321 rule is that uh, the backup data should be on two different storage types. So we're going to have two backups, and those backups cannot be on the same storage type. So let's say, for example, we were going to back up our SSD here onto the SSD. Now we could, if we bring over time shift, there's nothing I believe preventing us if we go into the settings with uh, I am using here SDA is uh, is my original yep so I can change it over to SDA 2 which is the partition that I have my Ubuntu desktop on here so there's nothing actually stopping me from creating backups onto the actual primary um, device I'm protecting the problem in that situation is that they're on the same storage media that means that uh, basically if that hard drive fails, for instance, the backup's going to go with it. Um, the backup's going to go with it. So therefore, they should be on two different storage media. Generally, you can achieve this, and I'm achieving this in my Ubuntu backup by having, um, and if I just bring over uh, this settings page, actually, because it does a nice job at showing what I have in place. So SD, SDA is a 480 gigabyte uh, drive and SSD and that's where my operating system lives on. Uh, you can see I've actually gone through relatively a relatively small amount of that. I just recently actually uh, uh, swapped out a 240 gig for a 480 gig just to give myself more room. I would say tangentially the reason with Linux backups um, the longer your system is stable the more you stand to lose uh, you know your modifications tend to accrue you tend to add more packages you might add unattended backups for example uh, sorry unattended upgrades which I always do and I just find that over time this is actually how I got into backups I would basically every second year uh, I've been using Ubuntu for like 10 years every second or third year something would break the system a leading as I've said at the start of the video it would be a leading release uh, a non LTS release First piece of advice, stick with LTS to LTS releases, more stable. Typically something like an LTS release would brick the system, ruin the package manager, ruin NVIDIA. And at that point it was really just not worth spending the two or three days. Uh, you can do that once or two times, you can reinstall your system two or three times. You will, if you do this, get to a point where you say never is this ever happening to me again. And that's why I decided to get really big into making sure good backups have been taken. And it's really paid dividends because I now have a stable system. Uh, but in order to keep it stable, I need to keep on top of this backup approach. And that's why I'm going to be spending the next 20 to 30 minutes uh, explaining it on this YouTube video. And I've certainly already spent a lot more than 20 to 30 minutes uh, putting together this documentation on GitHub for anybody interested. Um, but let's get back to what I have. So this is my primary system here. Um, and then SDB is where I stick my clonezilla. Now that's 240 gigs because 
I don't want to change anything here. That's 240 gigs because um, I take Clonezilla less regularly. It's not automated and therefore it's more work. Um, SDC is another drive that I have formatted to ext4 and um, this is where I put my time shift uh, time shift backups. Uh, time shift is creating basically uh, snapshots, restore points, something like what you have in Windows with your Windows restore points, similar to that. I'm not familiar uh, in depth with the Windows tool because just because I don't use Windows that frequently. Um, but it's a similar idea. So I basically have, you can see this is 480 gigs, this is 480 gigs, and I'm using actually not a whole bunch of, uh, of that uh, space, just, just as I'm not using a whole bunch of space. Uh, actually, I'm using roughly the same, it seems. Um, um, I think that's a coincidence because those are snapshots and there are three of them and this is one operating system. So I basically am using, for the sake of my backups, two dedicated disks. Uh, one for Clonezilla, one for Timeshift. Um, and why do I do two? Uh, essentially because Timeshift is a great tool but I don't trust it 100%. Um, if you're restoring from Timeshift you go into a you can do it directly from, um, let's just uh, exit out of this. You can restore from, you know, just click on restore and you can roll back to a snapshot. Now that's do, that's obviously, that if I were to go through this process now, it would be restoring a board live system, right? I've booted into the system that I'd be looking to restore from. I don't trust that really 100%. You can also use a command, you can do the CLI, boot into your Ubuntu system, get past the grub menu and you can there, um, run the same operation from the command line interface uh, before you've booted to the system and it's not live. I trust that a bit more. However, I trust Clonezilla more uh, than I trust Timeshift. I, I, Clonezilla is a very low level backup method and that's why I do two. But something else you could do would be to, um, you don't need to have two different, um, like basically I'm running two different, uh, two different, um, backup programs each gets its own drive uh, and I back up my hard drive my main drive SDA onto SD, SDB and SDC um, that's going actually beyond 321 because it's creating two on-site backups and then one off-site backup so three copies of my data here um, you could do RAID 1 uh, RAID is redundant array uh, redundant array of independent disks and you could just have another SDD, uh, another another drive, NVMe, as I said, HDD, doesn't matter, of the same size, and you could uh, use RAID to uh, constantly replicate locally. Um, I find this approach advantageous over, over doing a RAID configuration, and that's because I actually get to keep three snapshots um, here. So RAID, you have the latest and uh, there's a point that's sometimes made that you shouldn't mistake redundancy for backup. So RAID creates terrific redundancy. Um, you know, the whole world of backups fits you backups and you have data recovery. Um, if you just look up the difference between them, uh, you know, backups refers to creating the backups ahead of an anticipated disaster, like a hard drive failing. Disaster recovery encompasses a full strategy for responding to a disaster event and putting the backups into action. So that's that's concerned with the restore side. side. And another interesting allied field, I would say, is uh, business continuity management. And so if you're doing redundancy, if you're creating another RAID disk, you're giving yourself terrific redundancy. That, In other words, if you had, let's say, uh, uh, let's go back to our schematic here, sort of schematic uh, location. If we had an, we could put in another, uh, we could, let's say we created SDE, or let's just say SDD wasn't Windows, it was another, it was another component in our backup arsenal. So we could have a, we could be running RAID between SDA and SDE, and we could also have, that would give us redundancy, that if SDA um, were to uh, just without warning fail the hard the SDD completely failed we could immediately and that's business continuity swap over to SDE um, but that would be our latest copy essentially before the failure occurred in SDA so we might find that there was uh, there was stuff there's stuff in that uh, in SDE that wasn't to our liking but we wouldn't really have much of an option 
uh, in order to actually go back in time, we need to, we need we need to restore from a backup point. So in that scenario, uh, our our uh, our SDB would still be useful for us because we could uh, restore from SDP to SDE or from SDC to SDE. So that's why, in in in, in a kind of nutshell, why redundancy and backup are not the same things, and why both are actually required optimally. Um, one thing to mention here is it doesn't you can see these are all disks sitting within my computer if we go back to our uh my diagram here so basically why let's just understand 321 here for a second so we could we've covered this we need uh original plus two we've covered this um different storage media actually we haven't so let me explain it Basically, as I said, if we have the backup, if we had STD backed up onto STD, if STD failed, we'd, we'd have no backup. Um, now, where else could we, what else could we do? We could have a NAS, a network attached storage, like a Synology, and Synology have just sent me a NAS to play around with, so that's kind of cool. And uh, if, if we had STD backed up, backed up to our NAS, in the event that our that would be one on site uh, on a different storage media, so that's three two one compliant. And if STD failed, uh, if our primary failed, we would be able to um, you know restore onto a new storage media from our uh, Synology, or it could be a hard drive that we connect within an enclosure, or it could be an external, you know, one of these um, USB. Western Digital external SSD that you just exactly something like this that achieves about the same thing as if we had a hard drive in an enclosure and then kept the enclosure in in a in a uh, like a Barracuda for example. Now what's what's the what's the difference between this and an NAS? The difference would be that let's say between uses we put this in our cabinet. That means it's not connected to electricity. So when we're looking at the reasons why your on-site backups might be vulnerable, we're looking at basically a few catastrophic events we're looking at. For example, theft would be one. Uh, everything in your apartment or workplace is stolen. We could be looking at fire. Uh, the office goes up in fire. Your home, God forbid, goes up in fire. And everything is destroyed. Th so this, this will not actually be, any, be of any use if we have our uh, backup on something like this um, in that case. But if it's a power-related event, uh, for instance, there is a lightning surge or a massive power surge, and it blows out everything in the in our in our home office. Let's say, if our NAS and our uh, computer are both connected on that same circuit, there's a good chance that um, the NAS will be fried alongside the SSD. So if we um, actually take our backup on something not connected to the power, or or we could do we could do another on-site backup. If it's an NAS that we're backing up to on site, we have the advantage that the NAS will be constantly on online and we could therefore automate this on site backup. We could just do a, a simple cron job that would use rsync to incrementally back up our SDD, sorry, our SSD uh, onto the NAS at midnight every night, let's say. I and mean, let's say we keep the desktop running 24 7. Obviously, if we are uh, doing something like this and we're not keeping it connected to a network device, we're not going to be able to avail of that. Uh, so what we would what we would need to do uh, so that that's a use case why you might want to both let's say do an automatic backup onto a network attached storage and you might also want to do this and that would be again going, going beyond three two one we'd have in that case two on site backups one off site backup because we're going to do that next and that would therefore give us three one our primary data source plus three um, and don't forget as well just jumping back to the cloud for a second and if you look at this final part of my diagram where I'm describing doing a, p a pull from B2 onto our local server uh, if you have if you back up from one cloud Google Drive to another cloud B2 that's not 321 compliant yet you've only created one copy of your primary data source and not two um, and not two now they are on different storage media so that's great this is on you know, Google Drive's data center, this is in B2's data center. Realistically, that's fine. Um, but uh, you might want to pull it down and keep another copy on an on site storage like the NAS we mentioned. And the reason for that is because if we're dealing with um, local backups, it's easier to, typically easier to um, uh, restore local from local, and it's typically easier to restore cloud from cloud. 
why is that? If we're restoring, if we're restoring a uh, uh, a um, in the scenario where we suffer SDD disk failure here, and we need to restore from Watson or NES, it's going to be a lot quicker if we, you know, uh, put in a new um, SSD. And there's, a, by the way, there's a use case for having always having a spare SSD on file, unused, formatted in, in whatever you want ext4 for this very reason that we could just stick in a new EX, ext4 let's say our, our disk fails stick in a new ssd4 attach it to the motherboard and uh, run clonezilla and uh, just quickly restore and bingo you're back in action pretty 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 good in terms of business continuity almost as good as uh, using raid um, doing that it would be slower if we had to restore onto that new SSD from an offsite backup namely namely from Cloud, Cloudberry which does have a restore capability and I'm going to talk about Cloudberry shortly so quicker to do quicker quicker to restore local from local and for the same reason quicker to restore cloud from cloud if we lost our data in Dropbox uh, it would be quicker to upload it to another Dropbox account uh, over the wire from another cloud than it would be to do so from our desktop, uh, you know, or or are from or are from an NAS that we'd be pushing up. Why is that? It's the same reason that I did uh, my P2 to B2 backup here uh, on an EC2 instance because it was quicker to much much quicker to upload data on the cloud than it would be to uh, deal with my and I don't want to do this B test because just to show my IP address, but. Uh, I have an uplink of about three megabytes per second, megabits per second. Sorry, so it would take an eternity. Um, all right, I don't, I don't, I don't want to make this video a marathon. Uh, we're already at 22 minutes, so I'm going to try to keep this within the 30 minute mark. Um, so what do I do? One, I do time shift. Time shift, I uh, configure to uh, if I can get my time shift back here. I back up onto, uh, and this is for local backups. I back up onto. Uh, disk the same size as my um, as my main one and I keep uh, a monthly I keep two weeklies and I keep one daily so I don't know why I don't have four snapshots here time shift is good it's my first protocol if something goes wrong it means that I can do quickly uh, let's just jump out of this again restore from any of my restore points today is the 12th of June I have one from a few hours ago that that would be the one I would use if I uh, installed some package that broke the package manager or did something that just created a mess and I didn't want to spend the next two days getting out of that mess and I wanted to get on with my life, I would restore it from that guy. Um, if I had installed a packet a few days ago that then seemed to create and I could trace it back that it created some kind of massive uh, series of events that resulted in my system being bricked, I would go for that guy. And again, further back in time, I would go from this backup on the 5th of June. That would be about a week ago. As I said, I think I sh I'm missing a backup here, missing a snapshot. Um, they're pretty light. Uh, you just, I would recommend having the same size as as the di as the drive you're backing up. Storage is pretty cheap. Uh, you could also do this onto network attached storage. Uh, you could have an NAS, a, a Synology, as I as I said. And uh, this is just a front end that we're using rsync. Uh, it's basically just using rsync, which is an incremental backup uh, command line interface, and just you know creating a few snapshots um, and uh, so that you don't have to bother writing scripts, bash scripts, you don't have to bother running rsync with the correct operators, it does all that messy work for you um, and um, it's ba one thing to point out as it says here devices with Windows file systems NTFS and a FAT FAT so it just runs so you need to have ext4 or other Linux formatted uh, file systems for this to run so this little guy is, um, and you can also exclude and include stuff. Um, basically, I actually have forced it to include the stuff in my home user directory. By default, it excludes that, so I've added that folder. So it's actually basically taking a full uh, a full disk, and that's because within my user directory, I actually keep uh, um, I keep some network attached stuff and. Uh, so that actually if you have something like Google Drive that's mounted you might want to exclude that from within the include of your home user directory so that's time shift in a sec in, in a basically and it's used to create my first uh, on-site backup now the limitation as I said 
you can restore from this interface or you can restore from as a CLI and you just basically boot uh, into your computer uh, you know get up a shell uh, get up a a, a bash prompt and type in time shift um, minus minus uh, these are some of the commands minus minus uh, restore and you'll get you know you'll list out or just you know man time shift to call up the manual page and you'll it'll tell you which snapshots you have you tell it which snapshot you want to restore to you hit yes and then it starts a restore process uh, so that's my first port of call the second um, that's an incremental backup now uh, I mentioned I use clonezilla clonezilla is a very very uh, low level tool clonezilla dot org i believe i believe yes uh you can just download clonezilla put this onto a live usb it's a very very low level device um unlike uh unlike our friend time shift it doesn't have this uh limitation you can see many file systems are supported ext234 as well as the fat file systems and ntfs so it's actually it's cross platform so you don't need to just worry that you can actually use this also to back up a uh a window it's just going to get rid of this uh this advertising here um uh it also supports lvm2 um and they've got some screenshots here so basically i use this this is really what i expect is going to work uh in the event that for some reason my uh incremental restores are the time shift doesn't do the job um i ex i i've tested this and if you really really want to knock yourself out you should ideally and this is part of uh remember we looked at backups versus disaster recovery versus business continuity this is really part part of uh disaster recovery uh would be uh testing the restorability now clonezilla when you run it has an option to test the restorability of the backup it's just created but if you want to or well, you want to be extra sure i would actually go as far as recommending that you stick in a uh, test um, a test drive here uh, in order to actually um, try to write you know try to try to use clonezilla to restore onto the test drive boot into that and if that is replicates the functionality of the uh, of the primary disk you've just backed up then you know that the backup image is restorable that it's good uh, I just trust uh, because it's my second tier I don't have patience you could say that's really a lot of work, uh, but that's the optimal thing. So Clonezilla is uh, something I do manually, uh, and I do this really, as I said here, quarterly, and it's a full disk image, it's not incremental. Another important distinction. Um, I literally go in, I have another video on my YouTube, and I will actually, uh, it takes about probably 20 minutes, and uh, I'll put that onto, I, in my diagram, I've got an external hard drive, once I get my new NAS hooked up, I'm probably going to start doing them onto NAS. You can also uh, you can also encrypt those afterwards. Um, uh, I think you can encrypt them as the process runs. Uh, and obviously, if you're backing up on site, ideally for security, you should be encrypting uh, encrypting those backups. Um, so you know, if you had an encrypted file system using TimeShift and then encrypted those Clonezilla backups. Um, and this process I do quarterly because it's far less convenient. I don't need to worry about time shift. It does, it works by itself. Clonezilla, I mean, you could be extra diligent and do it weekly. Um, it just creates an image and uh, I use the uh, partition to image. So I take, it doesn't back up the disk. It drives up specifically the partition that my Ubuntu Linux desktop lives on. And then it uh, creates a nice image of that on this guy. And in the event that uh, time shift was not able to successfully restore um, restore a new there's another actually important distinction here and that's time shift in order to restore in the event that my um, SSD failed and I needed to restore I would need to firstly stick in a new uh, SSD I would need to install the time shift program I would need to then attach my uh, this guy my my uh, sorry I would need to install time shift onto Linux desktop and then I, then I would be able to you know see the existing <coughs> I would have to tell out where my time shift snapshots are and then pull them in you could say it's a little bit because you need to go through a whole manual install it's a little bit slower than this is just disk to disk so I could just put in a new SSD uh, in the event that uh, time shift uh, did not work and um, 
you know, it would probably be quicker in that instance that the disk was completely failed as opposed to there was a, just a packet gone wrong and the packet, ma packet manager uh, wasn't working. If that were the case, a simple software glitch, I would probably restore from time shift. If the disk, if it was actual, if it was an actual hardware failure, I would use um, I would use this guy because I could just directly run a restore over Clonezilla from uh, whatever it is, the NAS or the uh, external drive onto the primary, and I'd be back in action without needing to reinstall. That's my process for creating and uh, as I said this is actually going beyond 321 because I'm creating two backups locally and one in the cloud. Final thing I will demonstrate is what I'm using for uh, cloud backups. So this is a tool called uh, Cloudberry. I think it's like whatever their community edition. It's cross-platform and I'm not going to say too much about this. You just create a new backup plan. Uh, you tell it basically what to do. You then add, you can see all my backup storage is here. I have all my B2 um, buckets mapped out and really you just give it a job um, you say I need, please back up my local system the whole file system or my user directory in practice and this is maybe just the final thing I'll see in this video uh, Linux backups what directories you don't want to back up when you're backing up um, here we go, we have a nice little resource. Uh, you don't want to, when you're backing up a Linux system, uh, you do not want to do everything. Um, Linux, yes, yes, yes. Uh, there are things in a Linux system that are not going to be useful and actually they're going to, to the contrary. Uh, they're going to actually make, uh, I believe they're going to make it impossible to, to restore. So you want to, they've given a general, um, this resource for Linux slash Unix backups and you can see some of these I'm um, the boot uh, you should not include lost and found you should definitely not include this you might want to look for a uh, more specific uh, list of things you can exclude for your the specific Linux distribution you're running uh, so I would in my Cloudberry plan I would uh, if I'm doing a full disk one you can see my full disk backup plan here if I've basically told Cloudberry what to skip uh, I have told it where, where to put the data in B2 and that's pushing it up to the cloud. Now that's a really, really slow process. It takes days and it's painful. It is incremental. So once you run it for the first time, um, you can put it on a schedule as well, or you can just run it manually each time. Um, uh, sorry, I'm getting distracted. I'm actually, let me just finish this video before. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna actually run it again now. Um, so that's the final thing, the final chink in my armor, if you like, so to speak. Realistically, in terms of restoring a, a, a bricked Linux system, uh, there's really no need to go beyond time shift and clonezilla, but because of the 321 rule and just general best practice in which credibly there could be something like a, uh, as I said again, God forbid, a fire in this place and both the NAS and the uh, and this uh, every, the computer itself were uh, you know destroyed and I really really want you know and even in that case to be honest because all my data is on the cloud it would just be quicker easier to install Linux and uh, I think if anyone's apartment burned down uh, getting back their operating system just as it was and getting the programs the way they were and all the configurations is not going to be anybody's most pressing objective and there's another approach you can take, which I'm trying to do in GitHub as well, and that's just basically, uh, if I go to my Ubuntu modifications, I try to just map out. This is really documentation I've just done for myself. Um, you know, I've kind of listed out the packages. Uh, I did this a few days ago. Just what packages I have that I could also just kind of refer back to my own GitHub documents and say, uh, this is the stuff that I want to get back on my system. But uh, to comply with the best practice, I'm keeping a secure offsite backup up in B2. And if in this catastrophic scenario I outlined, I would, uh, you know, I could basically, um, if I didn't do Cloudberry, I could push, let, let's just say for the sake of argument, I had a fantastic home internet connection with um, one gigabyte per second upload speed. I could take a, um, I could take a full dis full local backup with Clonezilla. I could put that onto a network attached storage, as I said, a Synology device. And then I could upload from Synology onto B2 and in a reasonable amount of time, and I would cap a reasonable amount of time, realistically at a few hours. Uh, I'd push that as an offsite backup. 
then in the event that um, this guy failed and we weren't using something like RAID, I would install a new SSD uh, device. Uh, I would uh, just install a little, a little basic Linux, uh, the same distro I wanted to restore from. <coughs> um, I would then uh, download my uh, my Clonezilla uh, backup from my from my B2 from the cloud. Put that onto a um, put that onto a USB, or uh, download that back to my network attached storage. I would then stick a live USB into this system, and I wouldn't even need actually an operating system to be in existence yet. So I can just skip actually the installing Linux. Put in my live USB running Clonezilla, and I would restore, and I would tell Clonezilla to restore from let's say an NES was in this picture restore from my uh, my full system backup on the NAS onto the Linux backup it would onto the Linux desktop the new SSD it would run that process in about 10 minutes and then I would simply boot back to my boot back to my machine and I would have a backup from uh, that would replicate the system from whenever I took um, that full system backup and uh, push that up to the cloud and in the event that I was you know doing this process from a different location entirely my apartment had been destroyed and I was uh, backing up uh, you know from the cloud I would follow this and I'd be able to get my old computer desktop back in action just as it was uh, when I was instituting this backup so uh, 36 minutes later that is essentially how my current approach and as I said it's a work in progress v1.3 when I have a v1.4 uh, maybe I'll wait till v2.0 I will make another video uh, thank you for watching and uh, any questions or comments from anybody, uh, they can uh, go onto my website here, danielrosel.co.il, um, and I'm always happy to uh, you know discuss backups and whatever. So thanks for watching and uh, check out new videos soon on Daniel's Tech World.